Hey grade 12s and welcome to our final preparation for our NEC exam papers for mathematical literacy in the Metro North Education District. So today we're going to just have a basic overview and a look at what to expect, how to approach the papers, how to plan and then also how to best use the resources available on this platform. So if we start, what you should expect, you'll be writing two papers, it will be 150 marks each. Each paper will be three hours and there will be known and unknown contexts in both papers. So you might be wondering what is considered to be a known context. So if we just have a look at that, examples of known contexts, you can get these from your exam guideline. That's the 2021 version. And you'll see here, I just copied some of these for you into this presentation so that you can familiarize yourself with the types of questions that would be considered known context so remember question one to three would normally be known context and then question four and or five will have some unknown contexts in it if we look at the layout of your papers so first of all in paper one the weighting will be finance 60 percent data handling 35 percent then the remaining five percent will be made up of probability because probability is such a small percentage, it won't have its own question, but sub-questions of finance and data will contain parts on probability. If we now know the weighting and we look at the layout of the paper, the question one will be level one questions only. So these we call our easy to score questions, and that is why I would recommend you start with those. Question two will focus on finance. Three will focus on data handling. Four and five, there can be four or five questions, and there will be an integrated question containing both finance, data handling, and some probability. So why it's good to know the layout of the paper is so that you can decide what you would think your strengths are. So if you think you are really good at answering questions on data handling, then to go from question one to question three, and to start with the questions you know and you feel comfortable with. We need to think about how we are going to prepare for the exam. So some practical things that you can use, the examination guideline, I spoke about this, examples that you've done in your workbook or in your textbook, um, examples in the Mind the Gap book, uh, past papers that you can find on the ePortal, the weekly WCED lessons where they explain concepts and they are examples, telematics broadcasts and other TV broadcasts for the subject, have a look at the revision material, which you know was done per term. Go through your terminology booklets because they do like to ask definitions in some cases. And then also you can work through recordings of our past MNET tutoring sessions. So when we are in the exam session, so the day of the paper, what do we need to do? So first of all, we need to use the 10 minutes of reading time before we start to plan our approach. So what we mean by that is you need to start with the questions that you can answer and then move on to the rest. So we spoke about that briefly earlier, but remember that that's an important strategy that you can decide on on the day in that session. You do not have to answer the questions in the correct order. So chronologically, you don't have to do one, then two, then three, then four. You can do one and then three and then two or however you feel on the day. You do, however, have to complete a whole question at a time before moving on to the next question. If we look at the day of the paper. It's also so important for you to write down all the steps and I'll show you guys a little bit later why that's so important. So another thing on the day of the paper that you cannot forget is to bring some pens, to bring your calculator and then also to bring a ruler if it's about drawing a graph or if it's about measuring in paper two. The ruler is a very 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 important part of our exam papers. The last thing that you cannot forget at home is a positive can-do attitude. So we are not going to leave any gaps. We are going to attempt every question that we see in our exam paper. So when we are in the exam venue, what are we going to get? So that's something we sometimes stress about. So you'll see for this section of the presentation, I've used past papers just to give you an idea. If we look at this, you'll get a question paper. You guys will see it's the 2021 paper. 
you will most probably get an addendum and the addendum will have some annexures in it. So you need to remember to use the annexures for the specified questions. And just to show you guys, here it tells you, use the annexures. So annexure A for 2.2, annexure C for 4.3. So you need to make sure that when you are answering these questions, you are actually referring to the annexures and you have that booklet open next to you. Then you are probably also going to get an answer sheet if they want you to draw a graph. So when they ask you to draw a graph, you need to do this on the answer sheet and this must be handed in along with your answer booklet that you will be receiving. And here you can see it also tells you which question must be done on the answer sheet. So now that you know what to expect, what's going to be there, how are we going to approach the paper? We're going to look for keywords. Keywords can be words like calculate, determine, identify, suggest, and there's an explanation for you. This is also in the mind the gap of basically, if you see the word calculate, what do you know you're going to have to do? It's a numerical answer. So you're going to have to do some calculation. You have to show your working. So make sure that you look out for keywords and we're going to have a quick look at how we can make sense of questions using keywords. So if I look at this example, this is again from a past paper, it tells you a total amount of 400,000 Rand was budgeted for the marking team at this particular marking center. So what are the keywords we are looking for? Verify. That means that at the end we are going to say, therefore, yes, it was or no, it was not. So verify whether. Whether means it can be or it can't be. This amount is sufficient. What does sufficient mean? It means enough to pay the team for. And then they tell you the three things that you will need to consider. So see how just taking some time to read the question carefully gives us an idea of what to approach, what to take into consideration, what we must work out and how we must answer the question. If we look at another example, again from a past paper, here's a table. Remember, they will tell you what information to use from the table in the question. The first question says, identify the candidates. So when it says the candidates, we are going to have to refer to their names, whose test scores in both tests, so we are looking at both sets of data, differed by 30%. So now we know what we need to look at. The next question again says, calculate so there's going to have to be something that we're going to have to work out the value of the interquartile range so they're giving you a suggestion of what to do for test two so now we know we are only going to look at this part of the work so look how just approaching the questions in a good way helps you to know exactly how to answer them I told you earlier it's important to write down all your steps so why is it important look at this it's a long question but you get marks for every single step that you do so it's important to write down all the steps because you can get marks for steps that you performed and accurate parts of the calculation even if your final solution even if your final answer is not correct you can still get five out of six or four out of six so don't just try and write down the final answer Try to show your steps to show the marker how you got to the answer that you got to. So now that you have this idea of what to do, how to approach the questions, how are we going to use the resources on this platform to best prepare you for your final exam? We are going to start by watching the explanation video that would be made by one of our very, very, very capable and experienced tutors. Then after you've watched the explanation video, you are going to independently try to complete the worksheet. You will see these are context-based. A lot of them are from past papers. And then after you've done the worksheet, you are going to watch the video where the worksheet is marked and you are going to see how you fared and maybe see if you need to spend a little bit of extra time revising or going through more work on a specific topic or if you have grasped and mastered the basic skills for those topics. Right, I'm just going to be going through definitions and some exchange rate tables and so straight into exchange rates. Um, the definition of an exchange rate, the exchange rate is the rate at which the currency of one country is exchanged for the currency of another country. 
right for example um if you are given that you need one us dollar okay the exchange rate will be 18 rand and 19 cents this means the value of one us dollar is equivalent to the value of 18 rand and 19 cents okay um this was the exchange rate that was in existence as at 11 30 a.m on the 28th of september 2022 there is a specific reason why i specified the time and date there because exchange rates they never stay the same they're always changing always going up or going down okay so this was the um, exchange rate um, on that specific day at that specific time right and this rate can also be given as one rand is equivalent to 0 0.55 us dollars okay Right, so there's two ways of expressing ex an exchange rate. It's one rand is two. I'm just going to be giving an example of um, the US dollar. So you can give an exchange rate as one rand is equivalent to so much in US dollar terms. Or you can give it as one US dollar is equivalent to so much in South African rand terms. Okay, and both of these illustrations, um, they actually show us that the US dollar is stronger than the south african rand okay right all right um this slide just simply shows us the major currencies of the world we have the us dollar the euro we have the british pound japanese yen and canadian dollar and the south african rand okay obviously we can't not talk about the um south african rand okay Right, and then we have our exchange rate tables, right, I just need to explain a few things here. You will see that um, there's two columns under the exchange rate tables, right, um, whenever you get a question and you are given um, an exchange rate table that looks like the one that I have on the screen, the two amounts here, okay, on the left hand side, or the two columns, the left hand side column, and the right hand side column let me um, just explain what that means the first one i'm just going to be explaining with the british pound okay let me actually highlight what i'm going to be explaining right so explaining with the british pound um the first one okay the first one the first column okay it shows us the value in british pound terms of one rand okay so you will see one rand here is equivalent to 0 0.0516 british pound okay and if we look on the second column it's now the value in rand of one british pound so we need 19.39 rands to buy one british pound okay so whenever you are given the two amounts like this you must only choose one of them to use because basically it's the same um, representation they show exactly the same thing okay um, so as i have explained there the first column shows the value or the amount of foreign currency you get in exchange for one rand okay for instance we get 0 0.0516 pounds in exchange for one rand and the second amount column shows the amount in rand needed to get one unit of the other country's currency just like i explained you need 19.39 rand to buy you one british pound right um and then we're just going to go over straight to the word examples right the first one it says identify the weakest currency and the strongest currency okay let's start with the weakest currency here okay which one is the weakest currency right you can see if you're going to use the first column okay all these currencies here 0 0.05 this actually means five cents okay and in in pounds it actually referred to as pence okay so one rand will be equivalent to five pence or in other words this is five percent of their pound okay and in swiss franc um this is also five percent of their main currency okay if you go to the american dollar it's also um close to six percent 
of their currency, okay, 0 0.06. So you can see the rand is weaker than all these currencies here, okay, because there is less than one of theirs, okay, that is equal to one of the South African rand, okay. So all these currencies up to the Chinese yuan, all these currencies are actually stronger than the rand, okay. Um, but then we have the Russian rubble, which is 3.21. So you need 3.21 Russian rubble to equal one rand. So this means the rand is stronger than one Russian rubble. The same applies with the Indian rupee. Okay, you need 4.51 of the Indian rupee to equal one rand. So that implies that the South African rand is also stronger than the Indian rupee. But to answer the question, which um, currency is the weakest. The weakest will be the Indian rupee here because you need most, okay, which is actually 4.51 to get to one rand, okay. And then which currency is the strongest currency here? The strongest currency according to, I think it's easier if we explain using the second column, the strongest currency will be the one currency that you need the most rand to get um, one of their unit, okay, or one of their currency. So you see that for all these um, other currencies here, or for all these currencies, um, the most or the strongest will be the British pound because you need 19.39, whereas for the rest of them, it's actually 18 or less, okay, that you need, okay. So the British pound will be the strongest um, currency that we have. Right, and then um, moving on to the next question, and it says, how much in rand would one get if they exchanged 750 US dollars? Okay, let's deal with that question first. So we have the rand on the left-hand side, and we have dollar on the right-hand side. Right, so as I explained earlier on, you can just use one of the two numbers that are given in columns here and not both of them. So I'm going to go straight to um, the Rand dollar exchange rate. Okay, right, and the American dollar is here and there is our exchange rate that I'm highlighting. Right, so I've decided to use the first column. Okay, so according to the first column, one Rand Okay, I'm just going to highlight one rand is equivalent to 0 0.0551 US dollars. Okay, so that is the first line there. Okay, and then um, please take note of the fact that we are going to have the dollar on the one side of the equation or one side and the rand on the other side. So, to get to the answer that we need to get to, which is the answer that's going to come here in this area that I'm highlighting here, okay? We're going to move from the 750, okay? We're going to move up, and when we move up, we divide, okay? We, we always divide up or down, um, never mind the spelling for divide that I indicated here. <laughs> it should be divide, D-I-V-I-D-E, okay? So we divide up, and we multiply across, okay? So in order to come up with our answer, which is going to be in Rand, we take the 750 and we divide by 0 0.0551 and we multiply by one. In other words, we divide up or down, okay? And we multiply across. In other words, we divide the same currency and we multiply by the different currency because um, we always going to get a similar currency on the one side and a different currency across, okay? So if you're moving across to the other currency, that's when you multiply. If you're moving within the same currency, you divide, okay? So that's why we're taking the 750 because that is in US dollars. We divide by 0 0.0551 because that's also US dollars. So you divide the same currency and you multiply across. And we move, I'm trying to move across to the rand that's why we multiply by one. And then if we do that, we get an amount of 13,611.61. So that is the value of 750 US dollars in Rand term. 
Right, moving on. Um, for this question, we need to determine the, the value in rand that one would get if they exchanged 2,800 Indian rupees. So we're going to do exactly the same as we did with the US dollars. We have rand on one side and rupees on the other side. Right, so the exchange rate that we're going to use, um, we're going to use the first one. Um, one rand is equivalent to 4.51 Indian rupees. Okay, let me just highlight that um, exchange rate. It is this one here. Okay, right. So as I explained again in the previous example, we always divide the same currency and we multiply across. Okay, so the 2800 is representing the Indian rupees. Okay, and the exchange rate, also the 4.51, is the amount of Indian rupees that you need to buy one rand. So you divide the 2800 by 4.51 and you multiply by one okay and then you get an answer of 620.84 so this means 2800 rupees is equivalent to 620.84 rand i'm just carrying on with the calculation here it says table four below gives the exchange rates between the south african rands and some of the foreign currencies at, um, at the forex bureau on the 4th of january 2022 right um and the question says arrange the six currencies including the rand in order starting with the strongest value in terms of the currency rand exchange rate okay so if we're going to do that we're going to start with the pound sterling because um, that is the strongest currency um, from the ones that are given there because you need 21.70 rand to buy one pound sterling. Okay, and then the next one will be the euro because you need 18. Okay, so that's the second biggest number there. That will be 18.11. And then you get to the US dollar, which is 16.04. And then the puller. And then the rand itself must also be included there. And then the weakest currency that we have there is the Japanese yen. So that will be the last one in that group. Okay, then we move on to the next question, which says, um, Mr. Booty, an importer, bought 500 um, Aura DVD portable players from Japan. The cost price in Japan um, is... 3,974 Japanese yen, 0.85 per player. Then um, calculate the cost price of 500 DVDs in rands. Okay, so what we need to do is to determine, right, um, the cost price of one, and then we multiply the final answer by 500. Okay, so we must take the 3,974.85. Okay, we're going to divide up remember as i explained in the previous examples so we divide up and we multiply across in other words we divide the same currency the 3974.85 is representing the amount in japanese yen and the one also represents the amount in japanese yen so we're going to divide that amount by one because you're moving up and we multiply across by the 0 0.1 383. So the amount in rand will be equal to 3974.85 divided by 1 and then multiplied by 0 0.1383 and then we get an amount of 549.72 for each player. Okay, so the total for the 10 DVDs, it will be 10 multiplied by 549.72 which will give an amount of 5000 497.20 it started with all that um, scenario of tando and his german friend who were planning on a trip to the united kingdom um right so straight to the question and it says um tando's return trip using the emirates airline is charged at 9250 rand how much is this in euro right um so what i'm going to do here is i'm just going to highlight something that we're going to use uh, we're going to use this exchange rate here okay right um because that is the exchange rate. i just need to explain something that we have um in this we have 
two amount columns, okay, the first one, it's representing the value of one rand in the different countries' currencies. So if I am to explain using this euro, for instance, what this one represents or indicates is that one rand is valued at 0 0.0576 euro, okay? And if you are going to use the next column, okay, this is now the value of rands or the amount in rands that you need to buy one euro okay so this means you need 17.35 rand to buy one euro okay so this was um accurate according to um the exchange rate that existed um last week already so this is pretty recent okay so one thing that i need to mention as well is that um if for questions for answering questions you mustn't use both the values that you see here okay like the 0 0.0576 and also the 17.35 because those amounts are actually um the same calculations okay expressed differently of course okay so now referring back to our question right we need to determine how much 9250 is um in euro okay Right, so there is the question, 9,250 to euro. So this is what we need to do. We need to have our rands on one side and the euro on the other side. So you will see that there is our rand on one side and there is the euro on the opposite side. And we, we are given, okay, that one rand is equivalent to 0, 0,0576. As I said, you must only use one of the two values and not both of them. So I've decided to use the 0, 0,0576 because that is the value in euro of one rand. Okay, so once that is done, then we must write the um, the question or the amount that we need to convert, which is the 9,250, okay? And there's the 9,250. Um, learners must please take note of this fact that our rand or the amount in rands is on one side and also the, um, other currency is on the other side. So obviously we have a question mark here because we do not know the value of 9,250 Rand in Euro. Okay, so whatever answer that you're going to calculate here, it's going to be in Euro. So now how do we do this? Okay, we divide up and we multiply across. Okay, so you see as we are moving from the 9,250 to go up, Okay, we must divide by one because we're going up, okay, and then we multiply across. So the amount will be equal to the 9,250 divided by one and then multiplied by 0, 0,576. Okay, and that will give us our answer in euro as 525,03. So that is the value of 9,250 in euro. Right, so now moving on to the next question. Um, and the question reads, Tando is going to buy the two tickets for himself and Mario for the game. And each ticket is charged at 140 UK pounds. How much in Rand is Tando going to pay? So obviously we need to be um, mindful of the fact that now he's going to buy the two tickets himself. So that's why we took the 140, the price for each ticket, multiplied by two to get the amount in pounds as 280. So he needs to pay 280 pounds. But the question wants us to convert this amount and give it in rand terms. Okay, so now how do we do that? We do exactly like we did in the previous sum. Right, um, before we even go there, we need to determine which exchange rate are we going to use, okay? So I'm just going to highlight the pound versus rand exchange rate. And just like in the previous um, example that we did, these two amounts there, the 0 0.0516 and the 19.39, basically they do exactly the same job, okay? They are different amounts, but they represent exactly the same thing. The first one is representing the value in pound of one rand. And then the second one is representing the number of rands or the amount in rand that you need to buy one British pound. So in this example, I've decided to use the second amount, which is the 19.39. So in the first line, you will see the amount in rand is 19.39. So we need 19.39 rand 
to buy one pound. Okay, so one pound is equivalent to 19.39 rand. And how much do we need to convert? We need to convert the 280 pounds. Okay, one thing that is very, very important for learners to note here is that our pounds are always on the same side and the runs are always on the same side. We do not have the value of 280 pounds in rands. That's why there's a question mark here, okay? So in other words, that's what we're trying to determine, right? And one thing that um, you must also take note of is that if you are going up, you divide and across you multiply, okay? So the amount to be given by the 280, the amount that is given, okay, divided by one, why one? Because we're going up to one, but we're going across to 19.39. So across we multiply by 19.39, and that will give us an amount of 5,429 and 20 cents. So that is the amount that Tando is going to pay. Right. Right, moving on. Um, the next question reads, Mario is planning on not spending more than 2,000 euros in the UK. Convert this amount to UK pounds. So you see that this is a different kind of a question because we are not provided with a euro and pound exchange rate. Okay, but the link between those two exchange rates is the rand. So we must convert from the 2000 euro into rand first. Once that is done, then we take that amount and we convert it into um, into UK pounds. Okay, so now let's do that. We now know that um, if we are converting, we must divide the same currencies and we multiply by the one that is across. Okay, so we divide the same currencies, so that will be the 2000 divided by one, okay, and then multiplied by 17.35. Why are we taking the 2000 divided by one? Because this is the euro to rand exchange rate. Let me just highlight that. Right, euro to rand exchange rate. So I've decided to use the second amount in this case, okay? Right, so that is the amount in rands, okay? So the 17.35, that's the amount in rands that you need to buy one euro, okay? So the one is the euro. That's why we're taking the 2,000 divided by one because both of those are in euros. So which means we're moving up. Okay, and then we multiply across because the 17.35 is representing the rand. Okay, um, and that will give us a total amount of 34,722.22. So that is the value of 2,000 euro in rand. But then that's not the end of the question. We still need to convert this amount of rands into pounds. And how do we do that? we are going to use the first one um, this is the one that i've decided to use the first one and that is the value of one rand as given as 0 0.0516 pounds okay so the one is representing rand because we are converting or we are changing within the same amount which is within rands the 34722 0.22 is rands and we also divide by the one that also represent rands okay so that means we're moving up and then the one that is across is the 0 0.0516 because that is the value of one rand in pounds okay so if we do that then we'll get an amount of 1791.67 so this means we have answered this question which said convert the amount that he was not plan, um, planning on spending more than. Okay, in other words, he was not planning on spending more than 2,000 um, euro. So that 2,000 euro has the same value as 1,791.67. Okay, so that is the answer to the question. Right, moving on. Um, to the next question, and it reads, Mario is charged 300 euro for the flight back home to Berlin, Germany. He makes a statement that he's going to pay more than Tando is paying for the flight back to Cape Town. Verify Mario's claim if a one-way trip costs exactly half of the return trip. 
So I just need to point it out that a return trip, this actually means going there and coming back. So we do know already that um, Tando was paying 9,250 for the return trip, which means for going to the UK and coming back to Cape Town. Okay, so now because we want to verify who is going to pay more for the trip from UK to wherever they are going. Okay, so we need to determine how much Tando is paying just for that trip from the UK back to Cape Town. Okay, so we um, the, there is a statement here that says that um, it's the return trip is or the one-way trip is exactly half of the return trip. So which means half is to go there and the other half is to come back. So which means if we divide by two, then we get the flight charge of going to the UK and also coming back. So it costs 4,625 to go there and 4,625 to come back. Now, the next thing that we need to do is to determine how much in rand is Mario going to pay. We already know that he's paying 300 euros. Okay. So now how much is 300 euros in South African rand? Okay. So we take the 300 and we divide by this 0 0,0576 and we multiply by 1. Why are we dividing by 0 0,0576? Because if we take our euro exchange rate, it's right here. It's giving us the 0 0,0576, which means this is the value in euro. The 0 0,0576 is the value of one rand in euro. So remember, so it means the euro, the 300 um, euro and the 0 0,0576 euro is in the same line. So which means we're moving up and we divide when we move up and we multiply across. Across means the difference or the new exchange rate. Okay. Right, so that will be the 300 divided by 0 0.0576 and then we multiply by 1 and that will give us an amount of 5208,33. Okay, so now this is the amount that we need to compare with the 4625 and um, we can now conclude that his claim is correct, that he is paying more for going back to Berlin than Tando is paying for going back to Cape Town. Right, so I'm going to be going through definitions, um, some explaining some income tax tables, and then I'm going to give steps in calculating income tax, and I'm going to go through some simple examples um, on income tax relations. Right, so the very first term that I'm going to explain is gross income the word gross in itself it means total before any deduction has been made so your gross income is the sum of all the earnings that um, an individual gets before any deductions have been made right then um, the next thing that i'm going to explain is your tax deductible income okay this is also your non-taxable items okay so um that's exactly the same term okay tax deductible income or your non-taxable items that's basically the same thing so this is the portion of your income um, that does not get taxed okay and the two items that are non-taxable are your pension contributions and your donations okay so in any particular year if um, an individual has contributed to a pension contribution, there is a specific amount that must be subtracted from um, a person's gross income um, before we can calculate what we call the taxable income. Okay, because a pension um, or part of a pension is non-taxable. So it has to be removed from the gross income before we can calculate the taxable income. Okay, which brings me to the last term, okay, which is the taxable income. The taxable income is given as um, the difference between your gross income and the tax deductible incomes. Right, carrying on. So what we have here is an income tax table. And this income tax table is um, given in annual incomes. Um, so 
uh, before you can allocate a correct tax bracket for an individual, you need to make sure that the um, taxable income that you are working with is an annual taxable income. Sometimes what um, examiners do is that they give you the monthly taxable income. And then from that monthly taxable income, you need to multiply it by 12 so that you can get the annual taxable income. And then once that is done, then you can use that amount to allocate it to the correct tax bracket and then you use the criteria there to calculate the correct income tax. Right, some important terms that learners need to be aware of as well is a tax threshold. All these amounts that I have here, are, these are actually the current amounts for the current year, 2021-22 tax season. Um, it's actually 2022-23 tax season. Right, so what do we mean by tax threshold? A threshold is like a limit, okay? So for a person who is under the age of 65, that limit is 87,300. What do we mean by a limit of 87,300? So a limit, um, this basically means that if you are earning below 87,300 and you are under the age of 65, then it means you do not qualify to pay tax. But as soon as your income exceeds the 87,300, then you must start paying tax because then your income will be above the tax threshold. The tax threshold meaning the limit, okay? And that limit is age dependent. For people that are between the age of 65 and 75, the um, threshold is at 135,150. So for those people that are within that age bracket that earn an amount of over 135,150, they qualify to pay tax and they have to pay tax. It's mandatory actually to pay tax. It's not optional. You have to make sure that you pay tax. And then that amount for people that are 75 and over, it's slightly higher um, at 151,100 rand. And all these are annual amounts. Right, then we move on to your tax rebates. This is very, very important. Um, a tax rebate is basically an amount that one gets back from the South African Revenue Service. So for all qualifying taxpayers, everyone gets the primary rebate okay um but if you are above the age of 65 if you are between 65 and 75 in addition to the primary rebate that you get you also get the secondary rebate so which means for people that are between 65 and 75 they get two rebates they will get the primary rebate and also the um, secondary rebate um, the one mistake that I've seen many learners making here is that they only subtract a secondary rebate of 8,613 if someone is between age, um, the ages of 65 and 75 and they forget to add the primary rebate. Okay, um, so please remember um, you need to make sure that you add the secondary rebate and the primary rebate if an individual is between the age of 65 and 75 okay the same applies if a, if a person is above the age of 75 which means they qualify for the tertiary rebate if they qualify for the tertiary rebate it means they're also going to get the secondary rebate and the primary rebate because remember all these rebates are benefits to an individual and the older you are the more benefits you should get from um, the government. Okay, so if um, you only subtract the tertiary rebate of 2,871 from an individual, that is actually a disadvantage because you only subtracting to um, close to 3,000 instead of subtracting an amount that's close to um, actually more than 25,000. Okay, if you add all the three rebates together, you get an amount that is in excess of 25,000. Right, so that is very, very important for learners to, to take note of. Right, um, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go through the steps that one must go through in order to calculate the income tax. The very first step is to determine the annual income. And as I said earlier, if you've only been um, given the monthly taxable income, then you need to take that amount multiplied by 12. Okay, then moving on to step number two, you need to determine 
the tax deductible income okay that's the part of your income that must not get taxed it must be removed from um, your gross annual income so that you can determine your taxable income remember your taxable income that is now the gross income minus the tax deductible income or your non-taxable items and remember this is just your pension and donations um many questions that i've come across they only include pension i've i'm yet to come across a, a question that contains a donation as a non-taxable item right okay then we move on to step number four you need to check if the person qualifies to pay tax by using the tax threshold table okay remember um, the tax threshold table it's age dependent so if a person does not pay tax or does not qualify to pay tax then you do not have to um, allocate a specific amount to that person okay right and then the next step is step number five in which uh, we need to identify the correct tax bracket to allocate to an individual each tax bracket it shows us the criteria that's going to be used in calculating the income tax for that particular individual so you need to substitute um, the taxable income into the given formula and you use board mass to find the income tax for the year once that is done you need to calculate and then subtract rebates remember that the rebates are age dependent and you need to allocate the correct rebates remember if a person is below 65 they only qualify for the primary rebate if a person is between 65 and 75 they qualify for the primary rebate and secondary rebate and so forth right then we move on to step number seven which is to calculate and subtract the medical tax credits remember to check the number of dependents and um, the amount that is provided within the medical tax credits is a monthly amount so you need to remember to multiply those amounts by 12 to get the annual amount and then you can subtract it from the income tax to determine the monthly income tax you get your final answer and you divide it by 12. once you do this then it means you are done with your income tax calculation right so we carry on and we move on straight to the worked examples so um, the question here it says into which bracket does an individual who earns an annual income of 450,000 fall so i'm just going to assume that this 450,000 is the um, annual taxable income so if you look at the amount of 450,000, it's going to fall somewhere between 337,000 and 467,000. So, which means the correct allocation for this particular individual is bracket number three. Okay, so that will be the correct tax bracket for this particular individual, bracket number three, and we'll use that to calculate the um, the income tax. right um, and then the next question we are provided with uh, these are the thresholds um, and the question is does a 68 year old man who earns a monthly income of 12,000 rand qualify to pay tax right so the very first thing that we need to do there because the amount um, that we provided with is the monthly income okay so we need to take this monthly income multiplied by 12 to get the annual income and the annual income is 144,000 rand and for a 68 year old this is uh, going to be in the second line between 65 and 75 so which means the tax threshold for this particular individual is 135,150 so we can actually conclude that uh, because the 144,000 is above the 135,150, which is like the limit, so this individual qualifies to take to pay tax, and they have to pay.
So the question says, um, Tabo is a 45-year-old businessman. His monthly taxable income is 39500 and Tabo belongs to a medical aid fund. Okay, and then the question is, determine Tabo's annual taxable income. Right, so the annual taxable income, it's basically the monthly taxable income multiplied by 12. Okay, because there are 12 months in a year. So if we do that, we get an amount of 474,000 rand. So that is the annual taxable income. Right, moving on to the next bit of question. Right, and the question reads, um, calculate Tabo's monthly income tax so the calculation of um, the monthly income tax or income tax in general that's the bulk of what we're going to do under income tax right so i've already given the steps in how to calculate income tax so the very first thing that you need to do is to look at the annual taxable income for tabo it's given as 474,000, and you need to identify the correct tax bracket according to that particular individual so i'm just going to highlight um this amount of 474,000 is it's in bracket number four you can see this is the bracket that i'm highlighting there because 474 lies between the two numbers that are given there 467 501 and 613600 therefore definitely um tabo is going to be taxed according to bracket number four now what happens in bracket number four what is the criteria of bracket number four so the annual tax according to bracket number four will be given as 110,739 plus 36% of the taxable income above 467,500 where am I getting this information from it's right there the highlighted information on the right hand side okay so now we need to determine by how much is his income above 467500 okay so the second part or the last part of this this is basically substitution so we're taking his income of 474000 we subtract 467500 because we're trying to determine by how much is his income above 467500 as um, as required by this criteria here Okay, his taxable income um, above 467,500. So if we do that, we get an amount of 6,500. So we must now take the 110,739 and then we add 36% of the 6,500. Okay, that will give us an amount of 2,340. Okay, that's just 36% of 6,500. And then we must still add the 110,739, and those two will give us an amount of 113,079. You just need to make sure that this amount here, the 113, maybe I must just highlight with a different color, this one here, that is the taxable, um, that is the annual tax but before the rebates have been subtracted okay so that's not the amount that tabo is actually going to pay because rebates must still be subtracted okay right then we move on to the rebates because tabo is not above 65 okay tabo is below the age of 65 so which means he only qualifies for the primary rebate okay he's only going to get 15,714 that's the primary rebate okay and the medical aid credit tabo is only um he, uh, according to the information that we provided within the question he is the only person who is in the medical aid there's no mention of his dependents or a wife or something like that okay so tabo um is only going to contribute um for himself in the medical aid so which means he's only going to pay or to receive the 332 per month okay as a medical aid credit so we take the 332 multiply by 12 and we get an amount of 3984 okay so this is the amount that he must get back as well remember guys rebates must be subtracted medical aid credits must also be subtracted i've seen people making a mistake of adding rebates and also adding 
medical aid credits to the annual tax which I have highlighted in red here. You mustn't do that. You must subtract these two amounts because it's actually a benefit to the taxpayer because after rebates and medical aid credits have been taken into consideration, the taxpayer will end up paying less amount. So that's why these amounts have to be subtracted. Okay, so if we carry on, um, therefore the monthly tax will be the 113,000, which is the one that I've highlighted in red there, minus the 15,714, which is the primary rebate, also minus the 3,984, which is the medical aid credit. Okay, and then the amount that we get there, we must divide by 12 because we need to determine the amount that Tabo is going to pay per month. Okay, so if we do that, we'll get an amount of 93,381 and then divided by 12, that will give us an amount of 7,781.75. So that is the amount that Tabo is going to pay per month. Okay. Right, I'm um, carrying on to the next question. Um, so the question reads, Joy is a 52-year-old nurse who earns a salary of 286,500 rand per annum. She contributes 7% of her annual salary to a pension fund. She has only had two daughters listed as dependents on a medical aid. She is concerned that the 4,000 monthly income tax deduction is too much. Use the annexure A below to verify if this concern is warranted. Right, so um, you will see that I've broken this question down just to make it a little bit easier for the learners. Right, so the first thing that we need to do is to determine the taxable income. Remember, taxable income is going to be the annual income minus the pension contribution for the year. So we know that 7% um, of the annual income is the pension contribution. So that must be removed because um, the pension contribution is a non-taxable deduction. Okay, so if we take the 286,500, which is the annual um, salary, minus 7% of that same amount, okay, which comes to 20,555, um, and that will give us an amount of 266,445. So this means the 266 is the taxable income. Okay, now the next thing is we need to identify the correct tax bracket according to this 266, which is the taxable income. Okay, so now I'm just going to highlight the correct uh, tax bracket. Right, so definitely the correct tax bracket will be this one here. Okay, why am I highlighting this one? Because his amount of 266, this amount a year, it falls somewhere between these two numbers that I've highlighted there in the first column. Okay, so definitely um, Joy is going to be taxed according to the second bracket. Okay, there is bracket number two. Right, so what is or how do we calculate tax according to bracket number two? It's 37,062 plus 26% of the taxable income above 205,900. So this is just the criteria, okay? So once you have identified the correct bracket, you need to write the criteria down. And then the next step will be to substitute into the formula, okay? So we're substituting because we already know how much the taxable income is for this particular individual, it's 266. So we take the 266, subtract 205 because we need to determine by how much is her taxable income above the 205,900. Okay, so if we do that, we substitute and multiply by 26%, we get an amount of 15,741.70. Okay, right, so that is the correct amount. And then we must still add the 37,062 and then we get to an amount of 52,803.70. But remember, this is before rebates have been taken into consideration. Okay, 
right i'm just going to carry on on to the next slide right guys so just going to carry on um so the calculation of tax rebates for joy because joy is below the age of 65 she only qualifies for the primary rebate of 14958 rand according to this um, tax table that we have and then the next thing is we need to determine um, the total monthly um, the total medical aid credit that she's going to get um, so the amounts that we have there are monthly amounts okay so she's going to get um, as a main member 319 rand and the first dependent she has two daughters on her medical aid okay so the first daughter is going to pay 319 according to this criteria here and then the last daughter is going to pay 215 okay or she is going to receive 215 that's actually the correct way of saying it because medical aid credits this is like um the amount of money that you get back for being part of a medical aid um in that particular year okay so if we add these three amounts together multiply them by 12 we get a total of 10236 this means that um, joy is going to get back this amount from sars she's going to get it back or it's going to be subtracted from the amount of tax that she must pay right so the annual income tax that joy must pay remember we have the 52803.70 that's before the rebates have been taken into consideration so from this amount we must subtract the primary rebate of 14958 and then we must also subtract the 10236 which is the medical aid credit this will give us an amount of 27609.70 okay which means this is the total annual income tax that she must pay but because we need to determine how much is the monthly income tax we take the um, 27609.70 we divide it by 12 and we get an amount of 2381 cents okay so the we you must never forget to conclude the question because we're trying to verify the statement that joy made that she is um, the deductions that she is paying are too much so now what can we conclude her claim is actually valid because her deductions um her monthly tax deduction was actually four thousand per month and it's supposed to be two thousand three hundred according to our calculations so we can conclude and say that her claim is valid the deduction is too much let me just get into it so what i'm going to be doing under bep analysis is i'm going to give an introduction we are going to be giving some um, important terms and definitions and terminology then i'm going to make an illustration and i'm going to go through some work example All right just going through with the analysis the introduction All right so in order for a business to determine the exact point at which its income equals the expenses it must make use of the BEP analysis which is the break-even point analysis right the break-even point analysis it helps the businesses to optimize their profits by making sure that they produce a quantity that is higher than the break-even quantity remember at the break-even the income is exactly equal to the expenses and after the break-even point the business starts making a profit so it's very very important for business to uh, for businesses to make sure that they identify their break-even points all right carrying on with uh, the terminology that is important under bep analysis income is the money that comes into a business usually from sales or services rendered okay so basically um, if you want to find out the formula for the income of any business it is the price at which it's selling its product multiplied by the number of items that have been sold then we move on to our expenses expenses are basically the monies that are spent on producing the product or rendering a service and expenses are classified into your fixed expenses and your variable expenses okay expenses or, or your fixed expenses are those expenses that stay the same they do not change in relation to the number of units that you have produced or the number of units that you have sold for example 
rent. Okay, if your rent is ten thousand rand and you're selling muffins, it, the owner of the place that you're renting does not worry about the number of muffins that you're selling as long as you give him his ten thousand rand. Okay, so that ten thousand rand is fixed. Okay, whereas your variable expenses now these they change depending on the quantity sold or quantity produced. So if you are running a business where you're selling muffins, for instance, um, the amount of flour that you buy, it depends on the number of um, muffins that you are intending on producing or selling. Okay, so the more the number of muffins, the more you are going to pay in your um, flour costs. Okay, because that is a direct variable expense. Um, um, expense. Right, um, and then we move on to the illustration of the break-even point. Right, um, I've just drawn here um, a diagram of um, a specific company. It can be any company, um, but important points that I need to mention. Let me just um, use my um, my pointer here. Okay. So the very first, first point that I need to explain or the, um, the very first line that I need to explain is the income line. You will see that your income always starts at the origin at this point here and it goes up like that. OK, why does it start at the origin? It starts at the origin because if you do not sell anything, you do not get anything. So at a point where the number this company is actually for a number of um, number of jackets sold and then the income and expenses. OK, so if zero jackets have been sold, it implies that the amount that um, the company has received or their income is also zero because they haven't sold anything. OK, and then the other line that I want to explain is this line here, which represents the total expenses. Remember the total expenses. This is now the addition of your variable expenses plus your fixed expenses. Why do we start at 0.5,000? Because this 5,000 is representing the fixed costs. Okay, because even before you have produced any jacket, even before you have sold any jacket, you're already paying your 5,000 rand. So this is your fixed cost that have no relationship whatsoever with the number of jackets. Okay, and then of course um, the costs go up because now once you start producing the jackets, then you must pay for the jackets. Okay, remember it needs money for you to make money. So before you can sell the jackets, you need to spend money on the jackets. Okay. Right, so at a point of intersection of our two lines, the income line and the expenses line, um, this is what we call the break even point. At this point, the company is not making a profit and at the same time, it's also not making a loss. Okay, we say the company is actually breaking even. Okay, right, if you look on the left hand side, of the break even point okay you will see that the expenses line which is this one here okay the expenses line is above the income line so this region here is actually a loss if i can just write that down okay this is actually a loss okay okay so all this area here it's actually a loss because the expenses are higher than the income. But once you get to the right hand side of the break even point, you will see now that your income line is now above the total expenses line. So which means now the business is actually making a profit. I'm just going to write here. Okay, that would be profit. Right, all that area is representing profit. So it's very, very important for any business to be able to identify their break even point as early as possible because once they do that, then they know that they need to produce units that are above the break even point so that they can um, make a profit. Right, um, so for this particular company, their selling price per jacket was 250. Okay, so if their selling price is 250, 
what is the equation representing their income. The income will be given by 250 multiplied by n, n representing the number of jackets. Okay, so this question, um, I've seen it in quite a number of uh, exam, um, past exam papers. So you need to be able to identify or to be, you need to be able to give the equation that represents the income for any specific company. Okay, and then if the fixed cost is 5,000 Rand and the variable cost is 125 Rand per jacket, therefore the expenses, the total expenses will be given by the 5,000 plus 125 N, where N of course is the number of jackets. Okay, right, the other thing that we need to mention is that the break even point, okay, break even point formula that I'm going to give you here, it's used to determine the number of units that a company needs to sell in order to break even. Okay, so sometimes um, you can get a question in which you are required to come up with the break even point. Okay, so the formula is fixed costs divided by the selling price per item minus the cost price per item. So for this particular company that we're dealing with, their break-even point is given by 5,000, which is the fixed cost, according to what we can see here, divided by 250, which is the selling price per jacket, minus 125, which is the variable cost per jacket. That will give us an amount of 40 units. And you will see that this 40 units is exactly the same as what we have here. Okay, there is our break-even point of 40 units right i'm just going to carry on with this example and it reads joyce in the business of baking and selling top quality muffins she pays fixed costs of three thousand rand every month she pays an amount of two rand fifty per muffin as variable cost to cover things like flour sugar electricity and others she sells each muffin for 10 rand and then the question is, illustrate this information on a graph showing clearly the break-even point. Right, so the two lines have already been drawn here to illustrate or to indicate the income. Income, um, it always starts at the origin, okay? Because at zero level of muffin production, there is also zero income, okay? Right, but your total expenses they start already at 3,000 Rand. I'm just going to highlight the 3,000 Rand a year. It's not a coincidence that um, the total expenses are starting at 3,000, okay? Because we are given here that the fixed costs are 3,000, um, are worth 3,000 Rand, okay? So that is the value of um, our fixed costs. So our total expenses line also starts at the value of the fixed cost, which is 3,000 Rand, and then they go up, okay? So the point of intersection of the income line and the total expenses line is the break-even point. So there is our break-even point, okay? That is our break-even point, which means after selling 400 muffins, okay, or when Jo sells exactly 400 muffins, she is not making a profit, she is not making a loss. Okay, she is breaking even. Remember, on the left hand side, she's making a loss, and on the right hand side, she is making a profit. So, there is our break even point. Right, moving on. All right, carrying on. Um, the question reads How much profit? does she make if she sells exactly 750 muffins okay so we do know that our profit is the difference between income and expenses okay so the income we know that she is selling each muffin for 10 rand so the income from 750 muffins is going to be the 750 multiplied by 10 rand per muffin Okay, which will give us 7,500. And then the expenses, um, remember the expenses formula is um, the 3,000 plus 750, um, 250, sorry, 250 multiplied by N, N being now the number of muffins, which is the 750. Okay, so we 
just substituting into the formula and we get our 7500 minus 4875 which will give us a profit of 2625 so that is the profit that she will make if she sells exactly 750 muffins within a specific month okay So just going through the question, um, there is that whole story that is there, um, right? So straight to the question, it says calculate um, the total variable cost per hot chocolate she makes. So I'm assuming that um, you already went through the question, so you know that we referring to Jane starting her own cho um, hot chocolate store in the passage of a mall. So to go through the solutions variable costs you know variable costs these are costs that vary depending on the number of um, units produced so for this particular instance it's costs that vary depending on the number of cups of hot chocolate that she makes so obviously um, there is three components or three items that make up the variable cost for us in this question that will be the, um, the milk the chocolate powder and sugar, which of which all of those um, they are charged at 445. That's why we have our 445 there. And then the other variable cost is the cardboard cups, which is um, which are sold at 40 cents each. So that will be a variable cost because the more um, cups they buy, the more they are going to spend. And then the last item that makes up um, the variable cost component is the plastic spoons which are sold at 15 cents so if we add all those three components together we get five rand so which means the variable cost is five rand right um, moving on now to question number 1.2 and it says jane has decided she will sell her hot chocolate um, for 10 rand per cup. Um, use your answer to question 4.1, um, which is actually the previous question, to calculate Jane's markup percentage. Okay, so starting with that question 1.2.1, and we know that a markup is given as the profit over the cost price multiplied by 100. And we do know that the profit per cup is 5 rand. Okay, how do we know that it's 5 rand? Because she's selling um the cup for 10 rand and we have already determined that the variable cost for making each cup is five rand from the previous question so five minus five will give us a profit of five rand okay i know that we haven't um, taken into consideration the fixed cost but you will see just now why that happens right so it will be five divided by the cost price which is actually five as well and then we multiply by 100 and we'll get to a markup percentage of a hundred percent right then moving on to question 1.2.2 .2. um the question reads will all her markup be profit and you're required to explain the answer okay and i've already said here that all the markup will not be profit okay so the markup that she receives is not all going to be profit okay and the reason for that is that uh, the fixed cost must still be covered remember we did say here that that markup which is the five rand okay um that is the difference between the variable cost and the price per cup um for each hot chocolate cup Okay, so that only covers the variable cost. So fixed costs must still be covered. So we can't really say that the difference is all the profit. Okay, that is not all the profit because fixed costs haven't been included yet in the um, calculation of um, that markup. Okay, so that is the correct answer for question 1.2.2. 1, 1 right. Right, moving on now to question 1.3. Right, um, 1.3.1, the first question there, and it says, use the graph to explain why it is important for Jane to sell more than 500 cups in a month. 
Right, so I just need to highlight a few things regarding this graph. You will see that your income line, it starts at the origin and it goes all the way up like that, cutting across the expenses line. Right, um, and the expenses line, it starts at the point 2,500 because that is the value of the fixed costs. Very, very important. Right, um, so I'm going to spend more time explaining on this point that we call the break-even point. At the break-even point, the income and expenses are exactly the same. What does that mean? This means at this point, Jane is not making a profit, and at the same time, she's not making a loss. The income that she's getting is exactly equal to the expenses. Okay, so that happens when she sells exactly 500 cups of hot chocolate. Okay, so that is the break even point. So now, why is this point very important? No, now I'm, I'm just going to read the question again. It says, use the graph to explain why it is important for Jane to sell more than 500 cups in a month. Okay, so she needs to sell more than 500 because on the left hand side of this break even point, you can see that the expenses line, which is this one, okay, before we get to the break even point, the expenses line is above the income line, which means she is actually making a loss before you get to the break even point. And after the break even point, you can see the income line now is above the expenses line, which means the, um, she is now making a profit. So the further away she moves from the break-even point, which is the 500 cups of hot chocolate, then the more profit she makes. You can see the gap is getting bigger and bigger as you move away from the 500 units. Okay, so it's very important for Jane to make sure that she sells more than 500 cups because then she makes a profit. Okay, right, so that is what I have explained in this point. 500 cups represent the break-even point. Therefore, she must sell more than 500 cups so that she makes a profit. Okay, so that is very important to note there. And then um, the next question, 1.3.2, it says, um, reading off the graph, how much profit will Jane make if she sells 900 cups of hot chocolate? Right, 900 cups of hot chocolate. So that point, the 900 cups, we'll see it's this point here. This line here going up, this represents an um, output level or the number of cups, which is 900. So to, for us to determine the amount of profit that she makes, we'll need to look at the income that she gets, okay, from 900 cups which is represented by this amount here, which is 9,000 Rand. And the expenses that she must pay for 900 cups is represented by that much. Remember, this is total expenses, which is both the variable and also the fixed expenses. Okay, so that total is given by 7,000 Rand. Okay, so if we are to calculate the profit, we'll get to our profit being equal to 9,000 Rand minus the 7,000 Rand, which will give us a profit of 2,000 Rand um, when she sells 900 cups of hot chocolate. We get different types of tariffs. Today we are more specifically going to have a look at transport tariffs, um, bus, taxi, train, plane and ship are the transport tariffs that you can get. And telephone is like cell phone, landline, and hiring of a laptop. So a visual representation for you is like the My City buses in, uh, in Cape Town. The If you go by plane, ship, or the taxi. Okay, so our first example on the transport um, tariffs is um, a seven-day ticket from the Gau train in Pretoria. And the question 1.1 says, why are some of the blocks in the table shaded in gray? All right, so let's have a look. There is the block shaded in gray. And then the names of the stations where you can get on or off is on the left-hand side. And those same names are here at the bottom. So where we have Hatfields, we have Hatfields and there's a gray block. Then we have Pretoria, Pretoria, where they come together, it's a gray block. So it's gray 
because it represents the same station. 1.2, between which two stations is the ticket cost 387 Rand. So on the pricing system, we find the 387 Rand, and then we see it's between Rosebank and Centurion. So it's between Rosebank and Centurion. There's the two stations where the ticket price will be 387 Rand. Then we move along to 1.3. Calculate the cost for a single ticket from Marlborough to Midrand. So a single ticket and the seven day ticket pass gives you 10 single rides between two stations. So we're gonna do Midrand and Marlborough, and then we're going to see that it's 216 Rand, but remember the seven day ticket uh, pass is a 10 day single ride, and they want a single ride. So we're gonna say 216 divided by 10, so a single ticket will be 21 Rand 60 cents. 1.4, determine the price excluding VAT, of a seven day ticket between Santon and Rosebank. So the tickets on the seven day ticket pass has got um, VAT included. So we need to find the VAT excluded between Santon and Rosebank. And then we see it's 189. So we're gonna say 189 times 100 divided by 115, which equals 164 and 35. Why did we divide by 115? Because remember, in the price of 189 Rand, that of 15% was already included. All right, then we are moving along to 1.5. A single ticket between Mid Rand and Rhodesfield costs 31 Rand. Calculate how much a person would save if she bought a seven day ticket rather than buying a single ticket from Monday to Friday to work and back. So we're going to work out a single ticket. So we're going to say 31 Rand times 10 is 310. Why did we say times 10? Because remember, it's Monday to Friday to work and back. And then seven day ticket, we're going to first find out the price of the seven day ticket between Midrand and Rhodesfield, and that will be 279 Rand. And then they said, how much will this person save? So 310 minus 279 Rand, so you will save 31 Rand. All right, our second example on transport. Marius is planning to start his own taxi business in Cape Town. He plans to use the fee structure below. So he's got a base fare of 14 Rand 50 and a fee per kilometer of 9 Rand 50. The first question, 2.1, calculate the cost of a 12 kilometer taxi ride. So we're going to take the 14 Rand 50, which is the base fare, and we're going to add to that the 12 kilometers times the 9 Rand 50, which is the fee per kilometer. And then it's 128 Rand 50 cents for 12 kilometers. Then 2.2, if a trip costs 290 Rand, determine how far a person traveled. So we are going to do the reverse calculation now. 290 Rand minus the base fare of 14 Rand 50 equals 275 Rand 50. Then we're going to take 275 Rand 50 and divide it by the fee per kilometer of 9 Rand 50. And then we get 29 kilometers. So if you pay 290 Rand, you will be able to travel 29 kilometers. So then we are going to do telephone tariffs now. And a visual representation for you guys is landline, cell phone, and then if you hire a laptop, maybe. All right, so our example on telephone tariffs. Mr. Booty and his daughter, Jane, use the same cell phone network provider, but each use it under different conditions. So in other words, they have their own packages. Mr. Booty is on a contract here. He pays a fixed cost of 200 Rand per month for 100 minutes free. And after that, he pays 1 Rand 20 per minute. The total cost of the formula has been provided, and they explain to us that N is where it represents the minutes used. Jane is on prepaid, and she pays 175 Rand per minute. Then we have a table showing Mr. Booty's calls and his cost. 
and then we are going to calculate C, the missing value in the table. So let's have a look for us to calculate C. So if he's not making any calls, he's going to pay 200 Rand. If he makes 50 calls, he's going to pay 200 Rand. Uh, 100, he is still going to pay 200 because the first 100 minutes is free on his contract. We can also use the formula. So we're going to substitute into the formula. N is the number of minutes used, so it's 100 minus 100, which of course is 0. 0 times 120 is 0, so the total cost will be 200. Then we are going to calculate D. So for D, they give us the total cost as 500, and they want us to work out the total number of call minutes for the month. That's D. We're going to write down the formula that they gave they gave it to us, and now we're going to substitute into the formula. So we have the total cost, 500 Rand. 200 Rand is his fixed cost. We don't have D. We need to work out D. That is part of the formula. Why? Because it's um, the first 100 minutes is free, times 1 Rand 20 for the minutes after the 100 minutes. So we want D on its own. So 500 minus 200, why minus? Because we plus 200 there. And then 500 minus 200 is 300. If you multiply with 1 rand 20, we're going to divide by 1 rand 20. 300 divided by 1 rand 20 is 250. If we minus with 100, we're going to plus 100. And D is going to be 350. Then 412, explain the term prepaid in the context above. So prepaid means airtime is paid in advance or one pays before you can make any calls or SMSs or WhatsApp or anything like that. That is uh, the explanation in the term of prepaid. Then calculate the cost Jane paid in a month. She called for 200 minutes. Remember, Jane is on prepaid. So Jane will pay 1 rand 75 times 200 minutes. So Jane will pay 350 rand. All right, so example one. Bongi wants to renew a cell phone contract at the end of March. She does some research on the internet and finds four options that might suit her. Look at the options listed below and then determine which option will be the most cost effective for Bongi if she uses 200 minutes of airtime per month and 50 SMSs per month. All right, so option one says a monthly set fee of 400 Rand for 200 minutes airtime and 50 SMSs. And that is exactly what Bongi wants. So this option will cost her 400 Rand for 200 minutes and 50 SMSs. Then option number two, a monthly fee of 29 Rand and a charge of 130 per minute and 80 cents per SMS. So we will then say 29 Rand, which is the monthly fee or the cost uh, base fee, 1 Rand 30 times 200 minutes and 80 cents times the 50 SMSs. So then option number two will cost her 329 Rand. All right, let's go and calculate option number three. It says a monthly set fee of 56 Rand and a charge of 99 cents per minute and 75 cents per SMS. So if we calculate Bungi's option three, that's the set fee, 99 cents for the 200 minutes, 75 cents for the 50 SMSs. And then the total cost for option three will be 291 Rand 50 cents. Then option four, a monthly set fee of 350 for 150 minutes and 50 SMSs. Any extra minutes cost one rand 45 per minute. So option four, she will pay 350 rand for a set fee. In the 350 rand included will be 150 minutes and 50 SMSs. But remember, Bongi requires 200 minutes. So she will need to pay 
um, for the extra 50 minutes, one rand 45, and then option four will cost her 422 rand 50 cents. So now we need to go and have a look which option will suit her best and will be most cost effective. Therefore, option three will be most cost effective for Bongi. Our example two on the worksheet is about Tandu who lives in Hatfield and he works in Rosebank. He uses his car to travel from his home to the station and back. He uses the Gau train to travel between Hatfield and Rosebank. And from Rosebank, he uses a bus during peak times to his workplace. Tandu works a five-day week and a colleague travels with him uh, to the station. It costs him 450 Rand per month in petrol costs. His colleague pays 270 per month as his contribution towards the traveling cost. The Gauteng fare, the parking fare, the bus fares uh, are all in Rand and they are in Annexure B. You have lots of annexures there um, and different tables for each fare and note that all the prices include VAT. So the first question, determine how much money Tanda will spend in train fares if he uses the return trip train product for the 22-day working month. So train fare, Hatfield to Rosebank. Hatfield to Rosebank is 162 Rand. So we will take the 162 and multiply it with the 22-day uh, working month, and it's 3,564 Rand for the train fare. Okay, now we are going to move along to 512. Calculate Tandu's total monthly expenses to and from work for a 22-day working month if he uses the return trip train product. So the petrol cost, remember, he's paying 450. That's what it cost him, but his colleague will contribute to 70. So we're going to deduct that. And then his petrol cost is 180. Then we're going to move along to the parking cost. So you need to go to the annexure for parking, 22 days times 25 Rand, it's 550. Then we are going to move along to the bus cost. Then you need to go to the annexure for the bus cost. So it's going to be 10 Rand times 22 days times two trips, because remember, it needs to go back, it's return, and that is 440. So the question was total monthly expenses. So we're going to add everything together. Remember, do not forget the train fare of 3564 from the previous question. Then total monthly costs for Tandu will be 4,734 Rand. Then calculate the difference in total monthly expenses. If Tandu uses the monthly train product to travel to work for 22 days, rather than using the return trip train product, all right, so now we're using a different column, and that will cost him 3,030 Rand. So we're going to recalculate his monthly expenses. So everything stays exactly the same, except the ticket cost is now 3,030 Rand. And if he uses this option, it will be 4,200. They said we need to get the difference. So we take the answer from the previous question, 4734, minus this new option, 4,200, and then the difference is 534 Rand. 514, calculate the cost for the return trip train product from Centurion to Hatfield, excluding VAT. Remember, they did tell us that all prices include VAT, and the price is 78 Rand. So they want the cost excluding that. Remember, 78 Rand equals 150. That's what we have. What do we want? We want the 100%. That is um, excluding that. The 115 is inclusive of that. So we're going to say 78 Rand times 100 divided by 115. And that is 67 Rand 83. Another option is to calculate the VAT amount. 78 Rand times 15 divided by 115, and the VAT amount is then 10 Rand 17, and then the cost excluding VAT, 78 Rand minus the 10 Rand 17, which is 67 Rand 83. You can use any of these solutions, um, the one that you understand best.
All right, then we come to 515. Write down the ratio of the bus fare for rail user peak to the bus fare for non-rail user peak in the form of 1 to something, which is a unit ratio. So we are going to work with the 10 for peak and the 23 for non-peak. So it's 10 to 23. We need to have a unit ratio. How are we getting the 1 on the left-hand side? So remember, it's 10 divided by 10 gives you 1. Then we need to say 23 divided by 10, which is then 2.3. So in unit ratio, it's 1 to 2.3. All right, so the last question on the worksheet, 516. Calculate the percentage increase on the parking fares for 9 days. And between the 9-day and the 10-day period, you need to work out the percentage increase. So the two amounts that we are going to work with is the 273 for 9 days and the 304 for 10 days. We are going to calculate the percentage increase, write down the formula, substitute into the formula, and then punch into our calculator 304 minus 273 divided by 273 multiplied by a hundred, not a hundred percent, just a hundred. This is a unit. The answer is 11.355 percent, and then rounded to two decimal places will be 11.36. So important information regarding the tariffs is uh, we're going to focus on water and electricity in this uh, session. Uh, tariffs can be billed after usage if you get um, an electricity or water account. Tariffs can be prepaid, uh, pay up front before you use the water and electricity like we get in our houses where we have prepaid electricity or water meters. Units for water tariffs is normally kilo, liters or liters. In other words, they can give it to you in liters and you must convert it into kilo liters. Units for electricity is kilowatts. You need to understand the question to see, is there any free units maybe in uh, your tariff um, structure? Is it using a sliding scale? Is there a fixed cost maybe? And please note that that can be included in the price per kiloliter or kilowatt, or it can be excluded. So therefore, we need to study each question before we answer the question. All right, so let's answer the following questions on example number one. So here we have the water tariff structure that we are going to use. So let's just recap. Water usage is measured in kiloliters. The cost of water is determined according to a sliding scale. Water costs according to this tariff structure do not mean that if you use 61 kiloliters of water, then you calculate it according to a flat rate. Now, let me quickly explain the flat rate. So, the, flat, the meaning of the flat rate is you can't take the 61 kiloliters and think that it's going to um, be long or you need to put it in the 60 plus sliding scale or step. And then you take that and you multiply that with the 15 rand and 34 cents. And then we will get an answer of 935 rand and 74 cents. This is a totally wrong calculation because you did not use the sliding scale. That is charged on water like we mentioned earlier as well remember this question specifically stated that these tariffs exclude fat then we're going to continue and i am now going to add the question to the water tariff structure so the question that will go with this structure says calculate how much Good Boys Car Washing Bay pays a month, including VAT, when they use 25 kiloliters of water? And give a reason why a step-up increasing block rate system of water tariffs is used to charge water consumption other than a flat rate. So let's have a look at the question. What's important in this question? First of all, you need to work out what they pay per month. 
all right that was the first what do they pay per month the good boys car washing bay what are they going to pay per month for 25 kiloliters of water and they did ask for including vat so then we have a look here and we see okay the prices are excluding of vat so we need to remember that at the end of our question step water tariffs are used here and then the second part of the question is give a reason why a step rate is charged so we have a one question to answer to work out how much it's going to cost them for 25 liters including that and then we still need to continue to answer the rest of the question all right so let's go first uh, calculate the kiloliters per interval all right so how do we do that subtract the endpoints of the interval to get the maximum amount of kiloliters used per bracket so the endpoint that's an endpoint so six minus zero so there's six kiloliters here. Please note that this is free tariffs included. In other words, you can use up to six kiloliters of water and pay nothing. All right. Although, remember, you still use it, but you don't pay for it. All right. So there's six kiloliters there. Then the second interval, the endpoint is 15 minus six. So in that bracket, there's nine kiloliters. Then we come to the third bracket. All right. In the third bracket, there is 15 kiloliters, 30 minus 15. There is 15 kiloliters. But if we take our calculator and we say six plus nine, then we get to 15. And the good boys car washing bay using 25 kiloliters of water per month so we are not going to use all of the 15 kiloliters we only need to use 10 of the 15 because 6 plus 9 is 15 and then 10 makes up the 25 kiloliters so the amount used in this interval is the amount of the interval plus 15 to 30 so there is 15 kiloliters in the sliding scale, but we're only using 10. So then we add the kiloliters that we're going to use, the 6, the 9, and the 10, and we get to the 25 kiloliters that they told us they use per month. All right, so now we need to go and find out what's the cost. So the correct calculation using the sliding scale each interval has its own tariff, as you can see. So interval six, remember, although we are not paying anything for it, we are still using it. So six times zero is zero rand. In the next one, we worked out, remember, that there was nine. Nine times nine rand 35 is 84 rand 15. And then in the third interval, we are only using 10 multiplied by the tariff of the sliding scale here the step 11 rand 16 cents it adds up to 11 rand 111 rand 60 we add them all together and then we are going to pay 195 rand 75 cents but remember the question did say we need to add including that so then we need to still multiply with 115 percent which gives us then 225 rand 11 cents inclusive of that grade 12 you know that you can still multiply with 15 over 100 get an answer and add it i just multiplied with 115 we will get the same answer at the end okay so we are not done answering the whole question yet we did answer how much did they pay per month including that when they use the 25 kiloliters of water but we still have the second part of the question left. One more question to answer. It is give a reason why a step up increasing block rate system of water tariffs is used to charge water consumption other than a flat uh, single rate. All right, so let's see what can we answer. We can say increase the block rate tariffs to encourage saving water. 
Remember, the more water you use, the more you'll pay. Also assist small businesses or families with free water. So the first step in this structure for water was if you use six or less, you um, did not pay anything. So maybe it is to encourage people to use less than six kiloliters of water. Something that's also important is to remember your answer must be related to the question. All right, now we're going to do an example of tariffs with an addendum. So there will be a question and then there will be addendum um, attached to it or in the addendum booklet where you will get the electricity bill and you will get the kilowatts for electricity. And then we are going to answer these questions. All right, so let's go and answer the questions on example two. But before we do that, we are going to have a look at the um, electricity bill a bit more closely to see what it is that they actually give us. So we need to study it to understand the electricity bill. And if we then study it, then maybe when we read the questions, we will already have one or two of the answers. So what do we have? We have the street address. We have the client's name. We have an invoice number and we have the account number. Then we have the account date. We have a previous reading of kilowatts and we have a current reading of kilowatts. And if we then go and have a look at the dates, previous um, reading for kilowatts, current reading for kilowatts, it is more or less a month apart. Then we also have a missing value D and next to it, the meaning of D is total kilowatts used. Then we have um, an amount of 210 Rand 35. They say it is cost without VAT. And then we have an amount, a column there with nothing in it, which we, I'm sure we will need to work out when we go and have a look at the questions. Um, it says amount due including VAT 15%. Then we have a table one for the um, structures of the electricity tariffs. Then we have cost per kilowatt excluding VAT. We have a sliding scale, which they tell you the more you use, the more you pay. And then we need to have a look here that the prices are in cents. The, the cost per kilowatts. So in this case, electricity is charged according to a sliding scale. You know, there's the sliding scales. So we are going to exactly use the same procedure as I explained to you in the water tariffs. All right, so let's go and answer the questions regarding the electricity. So this is then the questions that must be answered. Ms. Lerato lives in ABC municipality. She needs assistance to understand the calculations involved in her electricity bill. Annex B contains the electricity bill and table one shows the electricity tariffs. So there's the electricity bill. So we're going to use this to answer the questions, to answer the first question. Determine the value of D, the amount of kilowatts used in March 2019. There's D. So remember we discussed on the previous slide, current reading is what your meter is on now. Previous reading is the previous month. We subtract the two from one another and we will get D, which is 150 kilowatts. Then we are going to have the table one with the electricity tariffs. So remember what we said, electricity tariffs works exactly the same as the water tariffs. So we are using 150 kilowatts. So 100 kilowatts will go into the first step at that price. And then we have 50 kilowatts left because she only used, Miss Lorato, only used 150. So if 100 goes in there, only 50 will go into the second step. So it's 100 kilowatts times the price, 132.70 cents, plus 50 in the step times 
0.30 cents. And then we're going to work them out and add them. And the answer is 21,035 cents. So to get from cents to rand, we're going to divide by 100. And then the price is 210 rand 35. Yes, there's 210 rand 35. And there is 210 rand 35 because it said show how the cost of 210 rand 35 was calculated. And then we showed. And then the last question is determine the VAT amount payable. So this is the amount without VAT. So they only want the VAT amount, not the amount including VAT, only the VAT amount. So we will take 210 rand 35 and work out 15% on that. And then the answer is 31 rand and 55 cents. The electricity tariffs in the municipality area where Jane lives is charged according to usage on a sliding scale indicated by blocks in the table below. So in this table below, they call it blocks. We also call it steps. And then horizontal, according to the block, is the tariff of this specific step or block. Prices are in cent per kilowatt and all prices include VAT at 15%. So the first question, uh, calculate the rate in rands that Jane paid for the first 50 kilowatts she used in May 2021. All right, so calculate the rate in rands. So if we look at the table here, we have the rate currently in cents. So they want you to convert the cent rate to rands. And how will we then convert that? We will say 96.61 divided by 100. So to go from cents to rand, we divide by 100. So then the rate is 0 0.9661 rand per kilowatt. If we convert the rate in cent, which they give you in the table, to the rate per rand. Determine the total amount that Jane paid for the first 50 kilowatts that she used. All right, so we will then go to the first step and we will multiply the 50 with the rate that they charge for this specific step. So we will say 96.61 cents, multiply by 50, and we get 4830.5 cents. We will then convert this to rand, which is 48 rand 30 cents, because you definitely will not tell someone that your electricity bill was 4830.5 cents. Then the third question, Determine the maximum number of kilowatts to be paid for in the second block. So the second block, the highest number is 400 and the lowest number is 50. So we will say 400 minus 50, which gives you 350 kilowatts that you will then place into the second block or the second step. All right, let's start with question number two. In question number two, it says electricity can be purchased from ESCOM in two ways, prepaid and postpaid. Refer to the comparative table below to answer the questions that follow. So a table has been provided, prepaid, where there's a fixed monthly cost, postpaid, where there's no fixed monthly cost, but we have a cost per unit in RAND, and according to the table, prices exclude VAT. First question says, write down the fixed monthly cost, for the prepaid system. So then we need to go to the prepaid system and we see that it is 200 Rand for the fixed monthly cost. Then the second question, the Smith household consists of three people, use 349.9 kilowatts of electricity on the postpaid system. How much would they be expected to pay excluding that on the postpaid system? So there is the different um, steps for the cost on the postpaid system and of course excluding that. So let's go and have a look. First of all, in the first step there is 50 kilowatts, 50 minus zero. 
then we take the 50 and we will multiply it with the 0 0.69. That is the tariff that's been given to us in the table. And for 50 kilowatts, we will then pay 34 rand and 50 cents. Then in the next step, 350 minus 50.1, we will then minus 350 minus 50.1, we get 299.9 kilowatts of units in that step. We will multiply it with the rate of 0 0.81, and then we um, pay 242 rand 92 cents. So the total units is 349.9 kilowatts. What they told us the three people is going to use. How did we get that? The 50 in the first step and the 2.99.9 in the second step. And then the total excluding VAT is 277 Rand and 42 cents. All right, let's start with question number three. So this is about Timoyo municipality that charges water for its residents using a sliding tariff scale. The more water you use, the more you pay. And then the table provided, table three, shows how the Moyo municipality structure the sliding tariff scale. In the first column, you have the number of kiloliters and the different scales, sliding scales. They divided it into. And in the second column, you have the different tariffs for the corresponding um, sliding scale. So the first question, a household in the Moyo Municipality used 17 kiloliters of water in a particular month. So how much did they pay for that 17 kiloliters? All right, so remember, we will go to our first category because it's a sliding tariff scale. And we will see we have six um, kiloliters in the first step, six minus zero. Then we'll take the six and we will multiply it with the tariff for this specific step. So we will say 6 times 2 rand 74 for the first step. Then in the second step, we have 11 kiloliters, and we will multiply it with the specific tariff for this step, which is then 3 rand 98. So 6 plus 11 kiloliters is then the 17 kiloliters, which this specific household used in this municipality. 6 times 2 rand 74 is 16 rand 44, and 11 kiloliters times 3 rand 98 is 43 rand 78. So without that, they will pay 60 rand 22 cents. The second question, the Moyo municipality announced that the water tariffs are due to increase by 9.72%. Calculate the increased water tariff per unit for units between 19 kiloliters and 23 kiloliters. So we want a specific um, tariff increase on a specific step. So it is the 19 to 23 uh, kiloliters step that we're going to work. And that tariff for that step is currently 4.67. So they said it will increase by 9.72. So we take the 4 rand 67 and times it with 9.72%, which amounts to 0 0.453924. So the new tariff will then be the 4 rand 67, which is the current tariff. And we add the increase that we worked out. And then the new tariff in the 19 to 23 kiloliters will be 5 rand 12 cents. So this is one way of working out. Another way is to multiply it with 109.72%, and then you will get 5 rand 12, exactly the same new tariff with the increase of 9.72%. All right, so let's go and have a look at uh, what are the measures of central tendency. They are mean, median, and mode. And then the definition, measures of central tendency are used to describe sets of data because they represent a middle value. Let's have a look at median. 
The median inner set of data is the middle value of all the numbers. Remember, the data must be arranged. The median can be odd or even. In other words, the data set can have odd numbers or even numbers. And again, I'm going to remind you because this is very important, arrange the data in ascending order, small to large. You can, of course, arrange the data in descending order from large to small, as long as the data is arranged. Finding the median. So let's have a look at a median with odd numbers. Always arrange the numbers in ascending order. Count the numbers in the data set. So we are going to count the numbers in this specific data set. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 numbers equals odd number. So only one middle value, 72. So let's go and have a look at a median with even numbers. Again, always arrange the numbers in ascending order. Count the numbers in the data set. So let's count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 equals even number set of data. So there will be two middle values. Two middle values, 72 and 76. So how do we find the median when we have an even data set? We take the two middle values, 72 and 76, and we add them together. And once we've added them together, we divide it by 2. So the answer is 74. And that is then the median of this data set with even numbers. All right, let's have a look at the mode. The mode of a set of data is the number that appears the most, or with the highest frequency, which also means the number that appears the most. If all the values in a set of data appear the same number of times, the set has no mode. Please note that you can't say that if there's no mode, that the mode is zero, because zero can be a mode if you have test scores and there's children who had zero for a specific test, then the mode can be zero. So we use the word no mode. Data sets can have more than one mode. When two or more values occur the same number of times, if a data set is two modes, we call it a bimodal. Let's calculate finding the mode. So we are first going to have a look at a data set with no mode. So in this specific data set, there is no number that appears more than once. Then a data set with one mode. So in this data set, the mode is three because three appears one, two, three times. A data set with a bimodal. So in this example, both the number three and 9 are modes, as they each occur three times, and no other number occurs more often. Let's have a look at how to calculate the mean. So the mean and average have the same meaning. Sometimes in an exam paper, they will say calculate the mean, and sometimes in an exam paper, they will say calculate the average. Just know that it's got exactly the same meaning. Mean is the average value in the data set. So the formula to calculate mean is sum of all the values divided by the total number of values. So how do we find the mean then? We add them up. We add up all the values in the data set and divide the sum by the number of the values. Let's have a look at finding the mean with an example. So the marks of seven students in a mathematical literacy test with a maximum possible mark of 20 are given below. Calculate the mean mark of the class. All right, so 
the mark of the seven students and we need to find the average of the test scores. So we're going to add them all up and we're going to divide it by seven. So when we add the test marks together, it is 105 and we're going to divide it by the seven. So then the mean mark of the class is 15. Let's have a look at range. So please note, range is not part of measures of central tendency, but measures of spread. The range of a data set indicates the difference between the highest and the lowest values in the data set. Range, the formula, is the highest value minus the lowest value. If the range is small, the data is clustered together. If the range is large, the data is more spread out. All right, let's have a look at finding the range. So in this example, it's about ages of students um, from ranging from 13 to 16 in a class. So the range will be the highest minus the lowest value. So it's 16 minus 13. So the range of the ages of the students in this example is three. Learners should be able to do the reverse calculations of the data as well. So we are going to have a look at an exam type question now. Let's have a look at an exam type question regarding reverse calculations. So I'm first going to give you the question as a whole, and we are going to have a look at important information that's been given to us. And then we will discuss each of the questions separately. So these are the data numbers or the data set that's been given to us. And in the specific data set, we have A missing and B missing. Please note, A will be a separate number and B indicates that it will be the same number that's missing. So when we're going to calculate B for an example and we get that B is 20, it will be 20 and 20. 20. We do not have three missing values. We just have two missing values. A is a missing value and B is a missing value. So this is information that we are going to use that will be provided to us. And they say B is a value greater than 24. And the range of the data set is 37. And the mean of this specific data set is 34. And then the two questions. Calculate A, the highest value in the data set. And the second question, calculate the value of B. All right, so let's go and have a look at the calculations. I'm going to just give you the data set again and the information that we are going to use. And then here is question one. Calculate A, the highest value in the data set. Now I'm thinking, all right, is there somewhere in this information, is there a hint for me? So I need to know which formula to use. So yes, there is a hint for me here, the highest value. So I'm thinking, okay, do I have a formula where I have highest value in? And then I'm going to have a look further and I see that, oh, well, there's another hint there for me. The range of the data set is 37. And then I think, yes, I have a formula that says range equals the highest value minus the lowest value. Now I substitute what I have. I have the range. The range is 37. They gave it to me. I don't have the highest value because they say calculate A, the highest value. So this is what I need to calculate. But I, I do have the lowest value in the data set, which is 15. Then I go and calculate A. So I say 37 plus 15 equals A. So what is A then? A is 52. 37 plus 15 a is 52. So now we have calculated A, the highest value in the data set. All right, so let's go and find the solution to the second question. 
So again, the data set and the information and the question now is calculate the value of B. So we are going to think, do we have hints? So they said, and the mean is 34. So they said the range of the data is 37, which we used in the previous question, and the mean is 34. And I'm thinking, all right, maybe I have a formula where I can work out the mean. They also say B is a value greater than 24. So we must keep that in mind, that when we get an answer at the end, when we have calculated B, that that value must be greater than 24. So we're going to just put it in the back of our heads, and when we've done the calculation, we're going to check. Then we need to remember that in the previous question, we um, worked out the missing value for A, and we need to remember that we now need to add this into our calculations. All right, so back to our hint, mean. We have a formula for mean, add up all the values and divide it by 16. Why 16? Because there's 16 values in this specific data set. Then we add up everything and remember A must be added together because we already worked it out. We are working out the missing value for B now. So adding up all the values without B is 494 plus 2B. Remember what I said? This will be the same answer. So we have two Bs. So then the next calculation will be 34 times 16. We need to get rid of the divide by 16. So we will multiply by 16. Then that answer is 544. When I plus 494, I need to minus 494 equals 2B. So this calculation is then 50. 50 is equal to 2B, 2 times B. And how do I get the value of B? I divide it by 2, and then the answer is 25. And then I am now going to go and check to see if it is correct with the statement that was made. B is a value greater than 24, and yes, B is a value greater than 24. Let's look at example number one. So example number one is a table of the top 11 biggest meteorite craters in the world. Then the question is calculate the difference. Difference means you need to subtract in years between the existence time um, of the Sudbury crater and the Moraquen crater. All right, so in this specific example, we have one, two, three, four columns in the table. And we need to make sure that we use the correct one. So we need to work with the existence time in million years. And then we are going to highlight Sudbury and the years and Moraquing and the years so that we get rid of the noise in the table. There's a lot of information. Get rid of them by highlighting or circling the ones that you need to use. Also take note that it is in million years. So we need to go back to the question and they say calculate the difference um, between the Sudbury crater and the Moraquen crater. So we're going to write it with the amount of zeros in millions and then we get to the answer or we can if we want to and we are scared that we are not going to use the correct amount of zeros when we write them out we can say 1849 million minus the 145 million and our answer will then be 1704 1704 million years All right, let's have a look at the second question. Using the size of the top 11 biggest craters in the world, which measure of central tendency best describe the set of data? Verify your answer by means of calculations. All right, so before we are going to attempt this question, I want us to have a look at the um, marks allocated to the question, six marks. There's a hint for us here, how to answer the question. 
it says which measures of central tendency best describe the data. So we have three measures of central tendency and we are going to calculate all three of them, starting with the first one, mode, median, mean. There's no need to do it in this order. You can do mean, median, mode. It doesn't matter. This is the answer that I'm going to do the example in. So we are first going to do our calculations and then we are going to go to the second part of the question where it says which measures of central tendency best describe the data set. So before we can answer that question, we first need to work out all three of them. That is why they say use measures of central tendency. All right, so let's go and have a look at the first one, mode. Mode is the one that occurs the most, and it refers to the size. So we are going to work in this column. So the mode is the number that occurs the most, and we have two number hundreds. So 100 kilometers or 100 is the mode in this specific data set that we are working with. Then the next one is the median. Now the median is the middle value. It's an uneven set of data, so there's 11 numbers here. And lucky for us, it's already been organized, either from big to small or small to big. So we have one middle value because the data is uneven, and that will be 90. So the median is then 90 kilometers. Now we're going to move along to the mean. So to work out the mean, we need to add up all the numbers and divide it by 11. And then if we add it up, it's 1174 divided by 11. That gives us 106.7 kilometers. Okay, so now we have calculated the measures of central tendency. Now we need to decide which one describes the measures of central tendency best. All right, so let's have a look at the data that's been given to us in this table or column. All right, so we see that there's a number way bigger than all the other numbers in the data set. And that number, if you can remember, is called an outlier. And an outlier will affect the mean because remember, for the mean, you need to add up everything and divide it by the number that's in the data set. So the mean will not be a good representation here. But the outlier will not affect the mode or the median. So in this case, your answer will be either the median or the mode will be representative because the 300 is an outlier which will affect the mean. Let's have a look at the third question on example number one. What is the probability of randomly selecting a crater from the top 11 biggest craters that is younger than 210 million years. All right, so younger, uh, we are going to work in this column again. So let's go and have a look at how many of them will be younger than 210. So there's 66, 35, 145, 70, 123. So the probability is five out of a possible 11. Let's start with example number two. If the average mean price of the inland 95 unleaded petrol was 14 rand 75 per litre for 2020, calculate the petrol price per litre during August 2020, the value of N. So that is the value that they're talking about. So they say inland 95 petrol, was 14 rand 75 and we are working with this column. Now the next step is we need to look for a hint. Yes, we have a hint, average mean. So we know that we do have a formula that represents mean. So it will be the total for the year plus n divided by 12. Um, why 12? Because there's 12 months in this year. We substitute what we have. They told us in the question that the mean is 14 rand 75. If we add up all the other values except the n, it adds up to 16182. Then plus n, because we need to calculate it, we divide it by 12, 
because of the 12 months in the year. Now we need to solve for n. So we use inverse operations. If we divide by 12, we're going to multiply by 12. If we do that calculation, we get 177. Then we need to get rid of the 16182 because remember n must be on its own because we want to solve for n. So we're going to, if we plus 161.82, we're going to minus 161.82. Now n will be on its own. So we just need to do this calculation and the answer is 15 rand 18 cents. So that is the value of n. Let's start with example three. So the table has been provided. This table is about screening at a specific school and the temperatures that were kept in isolation. So we have a column for grade, gender and seven days and then average temperature. Write down the lowest recorded temperature on day seven. So let's go to day seven, highlight it for yourself to get rid of the other noise in the table. You are working with column that says day seven now. So 35.4 is then the lowest recorded temperature of this specific day. 3.2.2 says explain the term mode. This is something that we need to study. Mode is the value that appears the most in a data set. The next question, determine the mode temperature on day one. So we are going to go to day one, circle or highlight it. We see there's a 36.4, there's another 36.4, there's a 36.9, and there is another 36.9. So we have a bimodal 36.4, and 36.9. Let's continue with the question. So again, the table and the question says, determine the median temperature of the learner in 11A from day one up to seven, excluding the average temperature. So they make it very clear that you are only using day one to day seven, not the column with the average temperature. Very important to remember, we are going to arrange the data because we want to work out the median. So we arrange from small to big. This is an uneven data set, seven. So we will have one middle value. So we are just going to start crossing out from the ends. And then we are going to calculate our median for this data set. And it's 37.5. The 3.2.5 um, arrange of temperatures of the learner in 8B is 2.7. If the value A is the maximum value, determine the value A, show all your calculations. So again, we have a hint there, and the hint is a range of temperatures of the learner in 8B. So we're gonna use the formula range. We substitute what we have. We have the range, they gave it to us in the question, and they said that it is 2.7. We don't have A, we are going to calculate A. We have the lowest 36.4. So now we are going to solve this. If we minus 36.4, then we are going to add 36.4 to calculate A. So now A is on its own. If we do that calculation, then A is 39.1. Let's do the last two questions on the worksheet. Um, 3.2.6, the average temperature of the learner in 10A is 37.87. Calculate the value B. Round your answer to one decimal place. Show all your calculations. So very important that we need to either highlight or circle important words for us. Um, they also say round to one decimal place. We will keep that in mind when we do our final answer. And we are working with the learner in 10A. Then we have a look there. It's almost similar to the um, 
example that we did in the explanation video of the uh, measures of central tendency. So the meaning of the two Bs is that it will be exactly the same number. If they were supposed to be different numbers, you would have had A and a B. B indicates it will be the same number. So this is about a learner who screened at school and on day three and day six, the learner had exactly the same temperature at screening. So we need to go and solve for B. We find the hint. We look for the hint. The hint is there for us in the question. Average, that's our hint. So we have a formula for average to work it out. Remember, average and mean is exactly the same thing. So what we do is we take all the screening temperatures of the learner in 10A and we add it together. And remember, we have a 1B and a second B. So we have two Bs. So when we add it together, we get 189.3. That is when we add all the values together plus 2B. Divided by 7, because there's 7 values in the data set, and mean they gave it to us in the question, 37.87. Now we're going to solve it. If we divide by 7, we're going to multiply by 7. 37.87 times 7 is 265.09. We are, we are working towards getting this on, our, uh, on its own. So if I plus... I need to minus. Remember, we solve it by inverse operations. So then I'm going to minus. Then my answer will be 75.79. That is the answer of two Bs. So then if I multiply by two B, I am going to divide by two B. And then the answer of B is 37.895. And then I remember they said final answer rounded to one decimal place. Then I do so. If we round to one decimal place, I look at the second one. The second one is more than five, so it will have an influence on the first one. So the eight will turn to nine. So the answer is 37.9. Then 3.2.7, explain why there are fewer records of temperatures of the learner in 10B. So we look at the learner in 10B and we see that on day 6 and 7 there was no screening. So what can be possibly the reason for that? Then we have a look at the last day the learner attended school and we see that it's 41.2. So an option can be that the learner is absent from school or another option can be the learner probably is in isolation at home because of the fact that the last temperature that was taken at the screening room was quite high. In this video, we are going to cover calculating the quartiles, how to determine the five number summary, how to find the interquartile range, and also to interpret the data in a box and whisker plot. So first of all, let's just recap what is measures of spread. So in our video, when we did the measures of central tendency, I also touched on measures of spread. So measures of spread are range, the quartiles, and the interquartile range. Range is a basic statistic that tells us the range of the values in a data set. The interquartile range tells you the range in the middle 50% of a set of data where the bulk of the data normally tends to lie. And quartiles divide your data set into quarters according to where those numbers falls on the number line. All right, so let's have a look at calculating the quartiles. The first thing that we need to know is that theory and practice go hand in hand. So there's always theory that we need to study before we can attempt the questions. So the first thing is arrange the data scores in ascending order or descending order, however you feel comfortable with it, as long as it is arranged from small to large or large to small. Find the median of the data set. Now, remember, the median is the number in the middle. Remember, 
an uneven data set, there will be one middle value. An even data set, two middle values. Find the median of the lower half of the scores, and we call that Q1. And find the median of the upper half of the scores, and we call that Q3. Also, remember, I'm going to talk to you about it just now, that the median is also Q2. So let's start to calculate. The first thing that we are going to calculate is the quartiles of an uneven or an odd data set. So remember, data must be arranged from small to large, and on the screen, they are already arranged. We have 11 numbers in this data set. Let's just count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. All right. It's an odd number. We'll have one middle value. And that middle value will be 39. 39 is either called Q2 or the median. Now we are going to go and uh, calculate the Q1. So Q1 is on the lower um, half of um, our data set. In other words, we're going to find the median of the lower half. All right. So we have one, two, three, four, five numbers in the lower half of our data set. So then the median um, of the lower half will be 32 and it's either called Q1 or the lowest um, quartile. Now we are going to do exactly the same and we are going to find the median of the upper half. If you want to call it, we're going to find the midpoint of the upper half. Again, we have one, two, three, four, five numbers and then our median of the upper half will be 51 and that you can either call it Q3 or the highest quartile, the midpoint um, of the upper half. All right, so that was calculating the quartiles of an uneven data set. We are continuing to calculate, and now we are going to calculate the quartiles of an even data set. Again, numbers are arranged from small to large. Let's go and count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That makes an even. Even data set, we will have two middle values. In this case, it is 35 and 39. So what will happen? We will add them together. We will say 35 plus 39 divided by 2 and then our Q2 or our median will be 37. Now we need to go and calculate the median of the lower half. So this is our lower half, this, this part here. So we have one two, three, four, five values in the lower part. We have one, two, three, four, five values in the upper part of the data. Please take note that we had two middle values because we have an even data set. And then I rule the line right in the middle of the data set. And we are using this part to work out the lower, the median of the lower half. All right, so we have one, two, three, four, five. So in this case, 32 will be our Q1 and 45 will be our Q3. All right, that is also called the middle of the bottom half and that is called the middle of the top half. So. This will be Q1, this is Q2, and that is Q3. All right, so let's discuss the five number summary. So when we are going 
to determine the five number summary, we need to arrange the numbers in ascending order. Then we need to identify the minimum value in the data set. We need to identify the maximum number in the data set, which of course is the largest number. We need to identify the median in the data set, which is Q2. We need to identify the lower quartile, which is Q1. We also need to identify the upper quartile, which is then Q3. All right. So before I um, discuss the box plot on your screen, I would like to bring to your attention that in the exam, you don't have to draw, you mustn't be able to draw a box and whisker plot, but you must be able to identify a five number summary and you must be able to interpret the box plot, but no need to be able to draw a box and whisker plot. So let's talk about the five number summary. So we have we we have five points. We have one, two, three, four, five points, and from there the name five number summary. So the five number summary consists out of the lowest value in the data set, Q1, Q2, Q3, and the highest number in the data set. So that is our five number summary and you must be able to identify the five number summary when a box and whisker plot is given or they can give you uh, data and they can say that you need to determine the five number summary. So now we're going to determine the interquartile range. So we, in short, we can talk about the IQR which is then the interquartile range. So the formula for the interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1. Um, please don't mistake the interquartile range for the range. Remember, the range is the highest value in the data set minus the lowest value in the data set. The IQR is the Q3 minus the Q1. So please do not mistake them for one another. The interquartile range represents the distance between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. In other words, the interquartile range gives us the range of the middle 50% of the values in a set of data. So let's have a look at the diagram on the screen. So if this is Q1, that is Q2, and that is Q3. So remember, Q2 is 50%. And if you have a look at the diagram, you will see 25 and 25%. So this is 50% of the data. The median halves the data set. The full data set is 100%. And in the middle is your 50%. So you have the lower 50%, and we have the upper 50%. And then we go and work out the quartiles. And then the quartiles divide the lower 50% into 25 and 25%. And Q3 divides the data, the upper 50% also in 25% and 25%. So we can talk about 25%, 50%, 75%, all right, because 25% up to here, I add another 25, so this is 50, that's how I arrive at 50, I take 50 and I add 25%, and it is 75%, then I add 25, and we come to a 100%, which is our full data set. And um, here is the, the same information just on a box and whisker plot. So just remind yourself that this is the box. Those are the whiskers. This is the minimum value. This is Q1, Q2, Q3, and the maximum value. So this is 25%. This is 25, 25, 25. And then, important to remember that from the Q1, until the Q3, we have 50%. So the box represents 50% of the 
of the data. In other words, the IQR gives us the range of the middle 50%, the middle 50% of the values in a set of data. So let's recap IQR. Quartile 1 represents 25% of the data. Quartile 2 represents 50% of the data. Quartile 3 represents 75% of the data. Because quartiles split the data into four parts, each part represents about 25% of the data. IQR is Q3 minus Q1, therefore it measures the middle 50% of the data. So let's go and have a look to interpret the data. So normally there'll be a question in an exam after a, a data question on quartiles. They will say, which one is the best, average, median or mode, or which one will describe the above data set the best? average, median, and mode. And then we don't know what to write. So let's go and have a look. First of all, we need to see if there's outliers in a data set. So let's just recap again what is an outlier. An outlier is a number that lies an abnormal distance from other values in the data set. Outliers are extremely high or low values from other values in the data set. So we need to remember this because outliers affect the average. Why do I say outliers um, affect will have an effect on average? Because remember, all the data gets added up and divided by the certain amount of data in the data set. So outliers does affect average. Outliers will not affect the median because the median is the middle value. And outliers will not affect mode. Mode is the one that occurs the most. So when will we use mode? Mode we will use if, say, for instance, you are selling shoes, mm, tackies, and you are selling different brands like Adidas, Nike, and any of those brands, and you would like to know which one sells the best. Then, then we will use mode um, to say that it will describe the data the best. So let's go and recap. When data, when we have data with outliers, uh, median will be the best option to represent the data. Why? Because of the fact that um, the outlier will not have any effect on the median, which is the middle value. When we have data without outliers, the average will be the best representative of the data. And like I just mentioned now, the mode is really the one that when you are selling um, merchandise um, and you want to know which one sells the best, then we will use mode. All right, let's continue to interpret data. So these two box plots compare the test results out of 30 in two classes. Which class did better on average? All right, so what we must remember, Q2 also is also called median. So our hint here is average. So they ask which class did better on average? So if we're going to go to the first class, we're going to the box plot, we're going to read off, and we're going to see that the average for class 1 is 19. Then we're going to do exactly the same with class 2. We're going to go to the average. We're going to see it's 25 and class 2 is 25. So which class did better on average? Definitely class 2 did better on average. All right, so we're going to continue to interpret data. We are going to use exactly the same um, data as in the previous slide. The question says, which class had a larger spread of results? Okay, so we need to find a word there that's going to help us, a hint. And the hint in this um, question is spread. So remember, the measures of spread, so we're going to use that. So we're going to use range and interquartile range. I just want to take a moment again so that we do not confuse the range and the interquartile range. The range is the highest value in the data set minus the lowest value in the data set. And the IQR is Q3 minus Q1. 
All right. And where do we find Q3? Q3 and Q1 is the box plot. All right. And that is my highest value in the data. And that is my lowest value in the data. All right. So spread. They said we which class had a larger spread of results. So we're going to start with the range of class one. So class one, the highest number is 23. The lowest number is 15. So the range is eight. Class two, the highest number is 30. And the lowest number is 10. So the range is 20. Now we're going to move along to the IQR. So class one. So it will be Q3, 21, minus Q1, 17. So the IQR for class one is 14. Then class two, Q3 is 27. Q1 is 20. So the IQR is 7. Remember the question, which class had a larger spread of results? So we can clearly see that class 2 had a larger spread of uh, the numbers in the data set. Let's start with example number 1. So on the worksheet, example one says MathLit paper one of the trial exam in 2020 was marked out of 120. Learners in grade 12B class scored the marks listed below. So there's a marks scored given to you. First question says determine the median. At this stage, a few things must run through your mind. Median, median means, means middle value. So first thing we need to do is we need to arrange the scores in order. The second thing, we need to count them. If it's an uneven number, we know there's one middle value. In this current 12B class course, there's 15 numbers. So we will only have one middle value, which will be 103. So the median is 103. Then we continue to 5.2.2, calculate the interquartile range. And let's just have a look. It says five marks. So you can't write one answer. You need to show your calculation. And it, it does say calculate. So show the calculation. All right, so for us to calculate the interquartile range, we need a value of Q1 and the value of Q3. So to find the value of Q1, we're going to go to the lower 50% of the data on this side. We count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven numbers in the lower 50%. So we know we'll have one middle value, and that middle value will be 100. Then we are going to do exactly the same on the upper 50% of the data. Also, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 numbers. So we get the median of the upper 50%. So that will be 111. And now we need to calculate the interquartile range. So we have Q1, which is 100. We don't need Q2, but the median is 103. And then we have Q3, which is 111. And the interquartile range is then Q3 minus Q1, which is 111 minus 100. So the interquartile range is then 11. Let's move along to example number two. So example number two is a graph below shows the percentage vehicle registration per province on the 31st of December 2020 and a few provinces were given in the table. The question says determine the province with the median percentage vehicle registration in December 2020. It says determine the province with the median percentage. So we have a hint here. We are going to work out the median the median and then once we have the median we will be able to de determine the province all right so we are going to arrange the data in order because the, we when we have the median data must be arranged we have an uneven data set there's nine provinces on the table so we ha will have one middle value and the middle value will be 6.68. So the median is 6.68%. But we haven't answered the question yet, because remember the question states, determine the province. 
So now we need to take this answer and see which province is the median. And then there is 6.68. So the Eastern Cape is then the province with the median percentage. All right, so let's move along to the next question, 5.2.2. Calculate the interquartile range of the percentage vehicle registration of the provinces. Please have a look. The question counts five marks, so an answer won't do the trick. You need to calculate the interquartile range. All right, first of all, we need to arrange the data. So the data must be arranged from small to large. We need to work out the interquartile range, so we need Q1, we need Q3. But for us to be able to work out Q1 and Q3, we first need to determine the median. So the median is then 6.68 in this arranged data set. All right, so then we are going to move along, and we are going to go to the lower 50% to determine Q1. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4 um, numbers in the lower 50%. So we will have two middle values for Q1. So we are going to then add them together and divide them by two. And the answer is 5.045%. Then we are going to do exactly the same with the upper 50%. One, two, three, four numbers in this specific data set in the upper 50%. And the numbers will be 13.38 and 16.15. Those are the median of the upper 50%. We will add them together, we will divide them by 2, and the answer is 14.765. But remember, they ask for the interquartile range. So the interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1. 14.765 minus 5.045, and the answer is 9.72% for the interquartile range of the specific data set. Okay, so let's move along to the question 5.2.3. Explain the term probability. Now, probability is theory, and theory must be studied. So the answer will be probability is the chance that an event is likely to happen. Then the next question, determine the probability as a decimal of randomly selecting a vehicle registered in the Gauteng province or in the Eastern Cape. So determine the probability as a decimal. So we are first going to determine the probability and then write it as a decimal. All right, so we have a look. There's nine provinces and we are, what is the probability of ran randomly selecting a vehicle registered in Gauteng and Eastern Cape? So it is a prob probability of two out of nine. So now we have it in probability and now we're going to say two divide by 9, which is 0 0.22. Let's start with example number 3. The grade 12 learners wrote a test in term 1 2020 before the pandemic and term 3 2020 during the pandemic. The marks were represented on a box and whisker plot. Study the graphs below and answer the following questions. The total mark for each test was 30 marks. So the question says, Explain the term outlier and state the biggest outlier of the two sets of data. Please take note that the question is uh, awarded four marks. So two marks will be for explaining what an outlier, outlier is, and the other two marks will be for then determining uh, the biggest outlier of the two sets. So remember we have discussed outliers in our previous video on the quartiles. So a value that lies outside most of the other values in a specific set of data. But then, well, this will earn, uh, earn you only two marks. Then we will go, and we still need to answer the second part. What's the biggest outlier of the two sets? So then we go to the two box and whisker plots. And we um, have a look. And then we see that if we look at the box and whisker plots of term 1 and term 2, remember this is the lowest value lowest value, that's the highest value, the highest value, and that is your Q1, Q2, and Q3. So there is a quite a big distance between the lowest value and Q1, and you don't find this in this box and whisker plot for term 3. So therefore, the biggest outlier of the two sets will be 9, which is in term 
1. So now we are going to answer question 3.1.2. Determine which test had the largest interquartile range between the test in term 1 and the test in term 3. Show all your calculations. If they say show all your calculations, then you do so because the, the question counts 6 marks. So interquartile range for term 1, remember Q3 minus Q1. So Q3 will be 25. Q1 will be 18, so the interquartile range is 7 for term 1. Then we will do exactly the same with term 3. So term 3, Q3 is 19, Q1 is 5, and the interquartile range is 14. They said determine which test had the largest interquartile range. So the test with the largest interquartile range is term 3. Okay, so we are going to answer the last question on example 3 on the worksheet. Explain the Im impact the pandemic had on the results of the two sets of data and use the measure of central tendency to justify your answer. Alright, so important that we need to use the measure of central tendency to answer the question. So just to recap again, they are mean, mode and median. That's the measures of central tendency. So you can either answer the learners performed much better in term one than in term three, or you can say the average on term one is higher than the average of term three. Stick to what they asked. They said measures of central tendency. So we use either mean, mode, or median to then best describe the data set. So great 12s, thank you so much for using this resource. We want to say good luck to all of our learners in Mnet. We believe in you and we hope that you are going to have lots and lots of success 